But that's modern tickets, Brian. What what do you that back in the old days? You know, the, the territories they charged hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars for wrestling tickets, right? You remember that, don't you? I got my ticket stub over here somewhere for the first ever Monday Night Raw. I was like the twenty eighth person or something to buy a ticket for the first ever Raw. I think it was twelve bucks. Yeah. And that was nineteen ninety three in Manhattan. In Manhattan. <laughs> Well, um, where's his name? Rob. Rob from Tulsa sent us an email that started a whole thing here. And he said that basically when he heard the recent episode talking about the current ticket prices, he he couldn't really believe his memory was correct when he was in high school and going to Mid-South Wrestling in Tulsa, general admission tickets he thought were $5. That's the way he remembered it. So he went into the newspaper archives of the Tulsa World and found the ad for the show that he was at, and he sent a copy of it along. Tulsa and was, he says, I mean, that was the big town, right? That was Watts' town, and that was a, an 84 when you were there. That was the big year for that town. Yes, and it, I would say Tulsa in the pecking order of Mid-South towns. The best town in the territory on a regular basis to my mind would have been Oklahoma city or Houston. That was the, the biggest gates most regularly, the, the most consistent crowds place. You're going to make some money right after that. And new Orleans doesn't count because there was such a wide variety. If you were in the Superdome, yes. But if you were in the, you know, downtown municipal auditorium, it wasn't as big as, Tulsa or Houston or even Jackson, Mississippi, or whatever the case. And by 84, New Orleans wasn't as important to Mid-South as it had been in, let's say, 82 or 81 when the dog was hotter, when Watts didn't have Oklahoma. Right. But anyway, nevertheless, so, but Tulsa was right behind, Tulsa was the next tier. It was generally right behind Oak City and, you know, Houston in terms of drawing ability. But nevertheless, he says we had Ric Flair... Hacksaw Butch Reed, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Ted DiBiase, Dick Murdoch, Jake Roberts, Humongous, he put in parentheses, Sid Vicious. I hate to pop your bubble, uh, Rob. It wasn't Sid <laughs> in 1985. That was Jeff Van Camp still, right? Or was I believe it? so. Yes. I worked with Jeff Van Camp. He was from Louisville, played football at University of Louisville. And I actually worked with him when he first broke in right before I went to Louisiana. We had a spot show. We had like a me and whoever I was managing, I can't even remember, in a handicap match. God, he was stiff. He, he was already humongous or just as Jeff Van Camp? No, he was just Jeff Van Camp. Huh. He didn't become humongous till later. But anyway, it was all for $5. No bullshit. In today's money, here's what he had the tickets were. Basically, in Tulsa in 1985, ringside was $10, which is twenty eight twenty in today's money. Re uh, reserve tickets were $8, which is twenty two fifty five in today's money. Adult general admission was $5, which was $14.10 in today's money. And kids general admission was $3, which was $8.46. And he said, my redneck buddies and I would drive 25 miles from the country to see the shows on Sundays. We sat by the same old lady, Louise, and the same family of five sat in front of us each time. Whoever got there first would save the general admission seats for the rest of the crew. And it was like a wrestling family, as we've talked about. As an aside, Louise was the best. She was probably 60 and smoked like a chimney, but she bought us all one beer, but just one, because we were 15 and 16. <laughs> so then, and this was on in October of... 1985, this show that we were talking about, it was Reed versus Flair for the world title. Yeah. Duggan versus Murdoch, Jake versus Humongous, DiBiase versus Sweet Tan. But as we will recall, October 85 was on a downhill slide for Mid South. And the ticket prices in Tulsa there were 10, 8, 5, and 3. But then Rob did some further digging in the Tulsa newspaper and came up with some 1984 shows that had different ticket prices and or, you know, different lineups and, you know, sent some ads for those. But those are the shows that I have my 
book for as well that I can show Gates for it, etc. And I thought it might be interesting if we looked at this because ticket prices in the territory days were somewhat consistent, you know, in each territory, each um, each promotion knew their towns in their territory and what they the people could afford and set the best prices. And obviously the prices in the Northeast were the highest, even in the territory days, New York, Philly, Boston, because those towns ran once a month in major buildings, NBA buildings, or whatever the case. And so the people expected to pay more. Down south, in these smaller markets, or with the towns running every week, you couldn't have that high a ticket price because you're expecting those people in smaller towns to come four times every month, where they only expected the people in New York or Philly to come every three or four weeks. So that's why the territories with the big markets like the Northeast or like Vern Gagne's Midwest with so many big towns to run, you know, had that advantage where they didn't have to go weekly, whereas, you know, the territories to have Florida was one state. So, but they ran a lot of shows, but they were on a weekly model. So was Georgia. So was the Tennessee Territory. So was Alabama, Continental, Southeastern. With Mid-South, it was sort of a combination. It was an every other week for the main towns. They ran every two weeks, or sometimes as he got busy and expanded every three weeks. New Orleans, was uh, they were all weekly towns to start out with in the old days, and New Orleans was the last holdout in his territory, which ended the weekly tradition by the end of 84. But still, there were smaller markets except for New Orleans and Houston, and you needed repetition of business. So the point is, within each territory, with the big major media markets, California out west in its day, Vern's AWA, the Northeast, they might be charging, I don't know, Brian, I don't have any WWWF information in front of me, but I bet you that a rings a front row ticket in Madison Square Garden was ten dollars probably by the early eighties, right? If not the late seventies. I think so. Okay, at the same time, a front row ticket in the Omni might have been seven or eight dollars, and a front row ticket in the Mid South Coliseum the same year was still four dollars. So there was a difference amongst the territories. And even in the same territory, when Watts had major spectaculars in Houston or the Superdome and jacked up the the Superdome ringside was twenty five dollars or Houston was fifteen dollars. He wouldn't have gone with a fifteen or twenty dollar ticket in Jackson, Mississippi, because it was Jackson, Mississippi. It was a whole different economic area, even though it was in the same wrestling territory. So you would have variations within your territories, but the idea was to strike the sweet spot between what they can afford to pay, we don't want to give it away, but we've got to draw these people, either 12, 24, or 48 to 52 times a year. And how much can the market bear and be a burden on these people to where we're costing ourselves money in the long run? So it was a, a tightrope act. And going back years and years, there were always, you know, incidents where you could raise the prices. And remember that that was an early NWA thing, Brian. You remember championship prices. If you brought the NWA world champion to town, and I, I don't know whether Sam Muchnick started this in St. Louis. I believe he did because you see back in the late 40s, early 50s, you know, it was acknowledged that here's the ticket prices for events where the world title, the world champion is, is defending. But it, it, Eddie Graham did it in Florida, and they did it in the early days of the Omni. And various places, if the world champion is on the card, the promoters would say, we had to pay such a guarantee to get this big match that championship prices are in effect, and they would either raise the normal prices for that town a dollar across the board. You know, if it was four, five, and six, it would then be five, six, and seven. Or maybe they do a golden circle where instead of all the floor seats being $8, 
the first row or the first two rows, you jack up to $12 because you're going to be the closest seats possible to that goddamn big memorable event. And I stole all these for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. We had, at the Super Bowl of Wrestling, we did a $25 front row in 1995 where you got the best seat in the house for the show. You got into a meet and greet beforehand with some of the stars, and we had waiters from Hooters bringing you stuff from the concession stand for your 25 bucks. But that was a thing that that would be done for big shows or it, like in the old days in the territories if if um, if they ran the secondary building in town. We talked about this on one of the guests the programs not not long ago with Mobile Alabama going to the big building when they usually ran the like the little expo hall. Or when Nick Goulis used to leave the Nashville Fairgrounds for a big match with the Sheik against Jackie Fargo, he'd go to the the auditorium downtown. So then tickets might be a dollar bigger because it's a mega event. So that's always been a thing, but it was never out of... The promoters always knew that the people we are selling tickets to are regular people that have families and lives and they're the lower income, if anything, in those days, and we can't run off our most devoted clientele. But I got into, as I said, into the 84 book. Before we talk about Tulsa, let me illustrate something for you, Brian. Have I ever told you the story of Lafayette, Louisiana? I don't know the story of Lafayette. I know of Lafayette. We've talked about Lafayette. But. Well, and uh, the story of Lafayette, Louisiana, is General Lafayette, this French <laughs> fuck, back in the... No. Um, this French La fuck. Lafayette, Louisiana, was one of the smaller towns that Watts went, ran regularly. Ran regularly. Watts looked like Elmer Fudd. Well, come on now. Lafayette was a TV market. It had its own local TV stations. Um, but it wasn't a big drawing wrestling town for most of the time. Because remember, Watts kind of built... Louisiana, it was never a big money state until he took over. But anyway, so Lafayette was decided just because they wanted to do it at a house show right before a TV taping. That's where the Midnight Express beat Magnum TA in Wrestling 2 for the Mid South Tag Team title, right? And then two turned on TA, walked out on him, and they started that whole deal. Well, we had started that program, but the, the first time that we were in Lafayette with it, because they didn't run it as you know regularly as some of the other towns, was on March 13th of 1984. And according to my records, it was a sellout at $13,600. And by the way, we made $225 each. So they, out of $225, $450, $675, and another for the eleven twenty five, they paid that tag team match eleven $1 hundred and twenty five dollars out of the thirteen thousand six hundred dollar gross. So the main event got what's that about seven percent of the house. Anyway, that was a sellout at thirteen thousand six hundred at the Lafayette Auditorium. And remember, I told you when we had a scaffold match, the auditorium, the ring was on a stage. And it was an actual auditorium where you'd like you to have concerts on this stage. That's where I, you know, told you that I used to like to take that bump over the rail like Harley Race because there was nobody sitting on the other side on that edge of the stage. I wasn't going over the into the people. Anyway, so because the rings on the stage, we had the scaffold match there. It had to be like 12 feet off the ground because the ceiling was too low. But it was a little building, and it, at those prices that they charged there, that was about 2,000 people, right? So now that we've sold that out, the next time we go to Lafayette, pardon me as I flip through my uh, book, is April 1st on a Sunday night, and that was a match with the Rock and Roll Express right off of our angle that we're about to be doing. and they had raised the ticket prices because of the last sellout. So this time we sold out again at $18,500. And that was a record house for Lafayette, like the, I believe the previous one was, but they had the same number of people. They just raised the prices because at that point in time, the opposite of what happened to him a year or two later was happening. 
the Gulf states were in a, a boom economy period. The oil business was doing great. And Houston, all over South Louisiana, down in New Orleans, they were just making money hand over fist, right? So now that's the second show on April 1st. So then we're out until looking, looking, looking. Where'd we go? God damn it. Sound like Randy Savage there. Looking, 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 looking. I'm trying to, ah, <laughs> we come back on April 29th. Now it's the last stampede with Bill Watts and, and Stagger Lee. And so those, all those shows had raised prices. So now they've raised the prices the third time in a row. And we sold out again. We did $21,500 in the same building, the same number of people. And we got $300. So that's three, six, nine for the three of us. Twelve. That that would mean if Watts paid himself the same thing, he paid us fifteen hundred dollars went to the main event, which is about now more like six percent. So it's shrinking steadily downward. How much do you think Watts paid himself for working the match? Well, actually, he probably paid himself three hundred dollars and then just took the fucking massive profit that he made <laughs> by owning the company from the last Stampede tour off the top. So that was April 29th. Then that's one of the biggest shows they've ever seen in an all-time record house for the third time in a row. So Lafayette gets a rest for a little while because we got a bunch of other places to go. And then we come back May 18th against the Rock and Roll Express with a regular card. And they went back to regular ticket prices. And I don't have the house recorded because it probably wasn't anything to write home about. But... Then we've given them a break. So then we can, this is just one of the smaller towns, but this is what Watts was doing. He was manipulating the ticket prices on a regular basis that year to see what the, the market would bear. We come back on June 30th. They gave Lafayette a break because all the other towns were cooking anyway. But this time the tickets are 15, 10, 8, and 5. And we're in the main event, Midnight versus the Rock and Roll Express for the Mid-South Tag Team title with me in a cage at ringside. And with those jacked up prices again, we did, we did another sellout and another record by just a little bit, $21,551. And this time, hold on, $357,1050. Seventeen fifty, so about seven percent, eight percent went to the main event. So then, after June thirtieth, we next come back two weeks later on July thirteenth with a smaller card. We're wrestling Magnum T A and Terry Taylor in the semifinal. I'm not sure what the main event was. Probably something with Duggan, and we sold out again. But this time the gate was only $17,800 because they dropped the ticket prices down for a regular card, but they were still higher than where they were at the start of the year. And the people were hanging with this. Then we come back 10 days later and do $12,000 on a regular show. So now we're into August. And these people in this little town have not said a word. We're still turning them fucking way for the most part, except on regular little shows. Then the end of August is eh. And then in the fall, the, the bigger shows start again, and they start jacking the prices back up, including when we finally get to, hold on, I'll get to the point of this, the scaffold match at the end of, uh, or the middle of December. Where is it? Lafayette, Sunday, December 16th, it was an afternoon, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was an evening show, but on a Sunday, and we did $15,500 in the middle of December at regular prices, we didn't sell out for the scaffold, but that town pretty much had all year and set a record, 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 and sooner or later, at some point, it has to fucking break, right? But that's what Watts was doing. He was manipulating the ticket prices in such a hot time based on the market and how hot the show was and what the, the market would bear. 
And we did this. That's where I'm going to go with Tulsa. He did the same thing there. And other times, you'll notice that a difference in building, not in the city, makes a difference in the gate. Uh, Rob, getting back to him, sent us information for July 15th, 1984, when instead of the the downtown assembly and convention center in Tulsa, which had been the established building, which was one we had all the major fucking riots in, the pavilion was the building out at the fairgrounds. And that's where we were on July 15th. And that card was Sonny King versus Buddy Landell, the Fantastics versus Crusher Khrushchev and Mr. Wrestling 2, who was Hercules Hernandez at that point. Junkyard Dog against Butch Reed. Hacksaw Duggan and Kerry Von Erich against the Midnight Express. Magnum TA versus Ernie Ladd for the North... Um, that was the North American title, right? And Terry Taylor versus Dr. Death. And that night, the house was $32,000, which was nothing to write home about for Tulsa. It wasn't a major show except for Kerry being loaned out. But... At the same point, that was Watts' home base, and that's why we noticed that the payoffs were better in almost every town than Tulsa. And then somebody tipped us off that Watts was taking the office expenses and or something else because of his base being there out of the town of Tulsa, and that's why that the pool for the boys was a little bit less, but we weren't supposed to know that. But the tickets were 10, 8, 6, and 4. $10 ringside, gen uh, uh, reserved $8, general admission 6, and $4 for kids, right? Which translates to today approximately $30, $23, $17.50, and $11 or $12. So it was still affordable because they were running Tulsa every two to three weeks. But then you go to the next month, August 26th, and this is not the next show. It's just what uh, Ben did the research on. But August 26th was a big event with Ric Flair in defending the world title against Kerry Von Erich. And Magnum TA was wrestling Buddy Landell, the Fantastics against the Midnight Express, Dusty Rhodes and Jim Duggan against Butch Reed and Hercules Hernandez, Sonny King versus Ernie Ladd, my God. I didn't get to see that one. Oh, my God. In 84? Ooh. Yeah. Terry Taylor versus Crusher Khrushchev and Art Cruz versus Dr. Death. Now they've got five categories of ticket prices. Instead of the previous month, it was $10 ringside. Ringside is now 25 and 15 because the NWA title's on the line and the fucking big stars are there, blah, blah, blah. Right? And, but then that's only the first few rows, however many rows. The rest of ringside was $15. Then the reserve tickets were up from 8 to 10. General admission was up from 5 to 8. Kids were up from whatever the fuck it was to 4 to 6. So the gross there that night was $53,000 with approximately the same amount of people. And then... Hold on here. Let me just zip forward a second for our uh, Tulsa. Ah, Tulsa on Friday, September 7th was back to the regular prices. And honestly, September 7th, back to school. Uh, the Friday after Labor Day, Tulsa was not a Friday night town, so it had everything working against us. We did $16,000. We got a $100 payoff. I managed... Hercules Hernandez against fucking, um, uh, God damn, who, what the Duggan? fuck? I can't even, no, against Duggan. There we go. I'm sorry. It, it, there yeah, was September. a sweat stain. Sweat stain was on the thing. And we wrestled the Fantastics and we had a riot with six marks involved. That was the <laughs> night. That was the night that we, I wrote, uh, I throw my belt in, clothesline Rogers, disqualification. They get the belt, whip us out of the ring. We go out and get juice on the whole audience. That's what I wrote at that night. Yeah, that's the story I've told. So that was September 7th, the worst house of the year in Tulsa. It's where we had the biggest fucking riot. Was Tulsa one of the towns that Fritz had a piece of? 
I believe so. I think I think anything in Oklahoma, which basically that was just Tulsa and Oak City that Watts ran, uh, Fritz got a piece of it because of the TV penetration he had from Texas. But anyhow, uh, so then the continuing in the Tulsa experiment, because usually every other Sunday or thereabouts was the Oklahoma trip where you do Oklahoma City primarily at the Myriad Arena, the big, nice place downtown, seated almost 13,000. But sometimes we'd have to go to the Fairgrounds Coliseum that they had run years ago, but the Myriad had become the preferred building. Great security, beautiful place, big gates, nice, new everything, right? Then we'd go to Tulsa for a 7.30 show that night, which was no matter what building they ran, the most dangerous regular town in the territory, and where we had riot after riot, that's the riot I just talked about, and that was the one where they, the fans hit the fucking sheriffs with the fucking chairs over the head and knocked the police out. Um, that would be our Sunday. And when we drove, we'd leave the night before because it was 525 miles from Oklahoma, or from where we lived in Alexandria to Oklahoma City, a hundred over to Tulsa and then 450 back home. So we would literally be on the road or working the shows from late the night before the shows until early the morning after the shows. We, you wouldn't be in bed. But anyway, Tulsa was another example of one of the towns that when he would have a big show, he would jack the prices up and then conversely, he would set different records and i'm flipping ahead to the end of the year to bring an end to the tulsa business in no uh hold on ah sunday december 2nd oklahoma city in the afternoon and tulsa that night we did the scaffold matches and at that point they made the ticket prices in oklahoma city and we were at the miri or no we were at the uh um goddamn fairgrounds in Oklahoma City instead of the Myriad, which killed us there because we'd done such big houses at the Myriad. We only did $61,000 at the fairgrounds. The ticket prices were 15, 10, 8, 6, and 4. And I think it was because the people that came to the Myriad didn't like to come to the fucking fairgrounds anymore, especially for that much money because you're liable to get in a fucking fight out there in that building. So it killed us in Oak City, but in Tulsa, we were, again, back in the normal building, or I'm sorry, at the uh, we were across downtown at the other building rather than the assembly center, and in that one, they jacked the prices up to 15, 12, 10, 8, and 5, and that one worked with Flair versus Magnum TA on the card as well as the rock and roll and midnight in the scaffold, we did $64,000, which was a sellout of the building and a fucking all time gate record in town. And that was the fourth record that we had set in Tulsa that year at different gate amounts. Do you have any questions so far, Brian? You know, <laughs> I've completely fallen in a hole on this. I have a few questions. One, I mean, what you're talking about is very interesting. And I guess as a follow up and, you know, eventually you left by the beginning of 85, you guys were gone. But can you do this too much to the point where it hurts things going forward, especially if things aren't that hot going forward? And secondly, with the AEW ticketing issues, they're not starting low and raising them for a big event. They're coming in high. Yeah. Once you do that, I mean, you really don't care how things look or appear, but to all of a sudden drastically lower them, is there any guarantee you're going to get more people than you would get that were going to come anyway at the higher price? Well, you're going to get some, but then also you've lowered your price and basically stooched yourself off that you can't you can't draw at that price. See, th this was a case where business was hot, or this was a, a case in the territories if they raised the prices where there was a special attraction, something that could be pointed to and say, this costs more, but here's why. You don't get to see this very often. 
this is the biggest match of all time, or look at the parade of stars, or it's in a big new building like the Superdome or something. They don't have any of that because they haven't structured their business. They don't have ongoing rivalries and programs between their talent that creates must-see matches where the people have to know what's going to happen to the point where they got to pay ticket prices that may be jacked up to do it. And that's what I'm saying. That's what you've lost with just whatever it is, the fuck that they're doing, not only just, they they only run, the WWE only runs a market once a year these days, right? But AEW is coming back to, the, because they don't have that many established markets, they're coming back to some of these well, maybe before they should at these kind of prices with nothing majorly different that you could point to and say, wow, this is worth it this time. And that's the territory business was built on repeat business and multiple multitudes of people. It was volume because if you had broadcast television and you had, you know, a, a geographic territory that you could control you could cultivate a following. You weren't spreading yourself all over the country, but at the same time, you weren't, you know, just running once a year where the people just go for a kick. You had them hooked with an ongoing program. So in summation with Tulsa, the city of Tulsa in 1984 had 21 wrestling events. No, um, yes, 21. And they grossed over seven hundred thousand dollars. A hundred thousand tickets were sold to the matches in Tulsa just in one year. And a hundred miles down the road in Oklahoma City, there were twenty-four events. And those events sold more than one hundred and eighty thousand tickets, and grossed over one point two million dollars. So just two towns in the state of Oklahoma grossed $2 million in 1984, but more importantly, sold almost 300,000 tickets. And with, with Tulsa, the that's why I was talking about the escalating prices. Uh, the scaffold match show drew 64 grand. That was a record. It broke the record set in August by Flair against Kerry that broke the record set in April by the last Stampede match. But then by the next year, they were back to regular prices because it wasn't a boom economy anymore and the, it, the business was not as hot as it had been. And so they, they still had to run their business and run their towns, but they couldn't do that anymore. So they were back to their regular ticket prices because they didn't want to price everybody out of the fucking thing. And it's the same thing that Dusty did in 86, in the Great American Bash, nobody had ever seen a $50 wrestling ticket in the state of North Carolina or almost anywhere else at that point. But Dusty said, if you want to be in, in Memorial Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina with 25,000 other people, or you want to be in Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia and be ringside, you're going to pay $50. You're going to see David Allen Coe and you're going to see Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, and Skydivers. And Delbert McClinton. And Delbert McClinton, every, you know, <laughs> they were, it was ridiculous to charge $50, but he gave them everything but the dancing bear. But at the same point, it, it, the prices were raised for Starcade or the prices were raised for the Great American Bash, but you still had all those regular shows. And in 1986, Charlotte and Greensboro, North Carolina, I say, and I'm free to discuss it, or if anybody wants to give me some documentation, but they were the two biggest drawing wrestling cities per capita in the United States. Show me any other two cities that size that sold more tickets. Charlotte, were, there was 12 events at the Charlotte Coliseum and one at the Memorial Stadium. And they sold 125,000 tickets and drew $1.2 million in Charlotte, North Carolina, one year. In Greensboro, they had 14 shows. And if you take out the closed circuit and just count the live attendance and gate for Starcade, Greensboro did another 125,000 tickets and $1.4 million. And in the state of North Carolina... In 1986, Jim Crockett Promotions, in addition to everything else they did everywhere else, ran 
about 100 live events in the state of North Carolina. And they grossed somewhere around $3.5 million on 400,000 tickets in one state in one year. That's because they had a clientele that was regular, that was loyal. They gave them an ongoing, episodic, violent fucking conflict that they could watch, that they were invested in the personalities, and they made it so that it was affordable to go every fucking time that they opened the doors of the arena. And we have none of that right now. Well, the other thing is, and it's important to point out, sadly, we are in an era where tickets for everything are up. We talked about baseball. It's not as easy to take your family to a afternoon weekend baseball game as it used to be. And Hell, I, I wouldn't even be able to afford to take my mistress. Well, there you go. Or a concert. If it's a concert with a reputable band in a big building, you're going to pay up the ass for everything. So, I mean, AEW is in that world. Is AEW the, the wrestling equivalent of a competent band <laughs> in, in, no. in today's environment. And the other issue is, and I think I briefly mentioned it earlier, the merch. We've heard from a number of people who have attended their house shows and actually said, I wanted to buy a t-shirt of whoever. There was nothing. They said there were just like four options and it wasn't even anything good. And there was one merch stand. And that's where it's ridiculous. WWE ran their system for years, did it really well. Now they have fanatics doing it. It's a major league company, whether you like them or not. AEW, what the hell's going on over there? They they don't bring enough merch to sell to the people they actually get into the building? Well, you know, those trucks are expensive to rent. To carry all that stuff. I'm surprised these people can eat when they go home that night. Their refrigerators aren't empty because they bought these tickets, much less buy a T-shirt and a hot dog at the building. I think they're going to be on cat food for a week after they go see this thing live. Anyway, thank you, Rob, for sending this in and starting this whole thing. And and just real quick, that's why a lot of the guys in the old days, you'd try to go out and look at the crowd and eyeball the house, see what your payoff was, right? And some guys were good at it and some guys weren't, but a lot of people don't realize that the, the amount of each price level tickets in every building is different, even if they're not changing the prices around. And roughly, that's why for to figure out an average ticket price, round number, if there's 10,000 seats in a building, let's say 8,000 of them are general admission. And they're $10. That means that's 80 grand. And then let's say there's 1,500 reserve seats at $20. There's 30 grand. That's 110. And there's 500 ringside seats at $50. There's 25 grand. So there, there's how you figure your house. But if many of the general admission tickets are sold and those seats are full, but nobody's in the expensive ones, then your average ticket price goes way down. So the same number of people pay less money. Or in the old days when you had a bad house, but most of the people that did come were the dedicated fans that wanted to be ringside or as close as possible and general admission they'd be shooting deer in the balcony you might not have a lot of people but your average ticket price was up because the ones that were there spent more money overall on average on the tickets so to figure out a house you have to know not only how many people are in the building but how the building is set up and where the reserve seats are, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's why I always tried to take that into account when figuring. We always used to ask the house, the gate. That's all we cared about. We didn't want to know how many people were there. What's the house? $82,000. Okay, question asked and answered. They wouldn't say 7,942 people. We didn't give a shit. So when going back and trying to figure out how... Many people were actually at these shows to give a statistic that the regular fans can, you know, kind of identify with. That is where it became necessary to try to figure out, you know, what was the average ticket? What were they paying back then? And 
And I started recording some of the ticket prices in my book toward the end of 84 when I realized, me being the little greenhorn rookie that I was, that the higher the ticket prices, the higher the potential gate and the higher payoff I hopefully was going to get. And generally, then we, we got the formula that I was talking about earlier, the 6 or 7% or whatever. And like I said, Tulsa was light, but you'd get a better payoff if you did a big house in a town that never drew. The Rock and Roll and Midnight sold out the Township Auditorium in Columbia, South Carolina for the first time in, I think, eight years in 1986. And it was only a $32,000 house or whatever, but Crockett was so fucking thrilled he gave us a grand apiece. So the main event got five grand on a $30,000 house. You know, later on, he may have regretted being so willy-nilly with his money. Well, he, he, he may have been <laughs> willy there, but he was nilly on some of the other ones to make up for it. But but that was the thing is, and, and that's, I've told the story where once I got kind of good at eyeballing it and figuring out what the house was going to be and then transferring that into seeing the promoter's payoff patterns and knowing what our check was going to be, when Bobby'd get in the ring, he'd grab a hold on somebody and I'd be, at the start of the match, I'd be looking at the crowd and I'd lean with my elbow on the apron of the ring and I'd hold up on the side of my cheek the number of figures indicate fingers indicating what our payoff was going to be. If it was two finger, two hundred dollars. Okay, I'll hold this hold a while longer. If I put up four or five fingers, four or five hundred dollars, he'd get up and do a little high spot. But if I used my left hand and put the one up, that means it was a thousand dollar payoff, and he'd get up and start doing everything in sight. And mostly, I was pretty close. Were there guys like from when you first got into the business that would stand and, you know, at the very beginning of the show, they would just be there counting. They knew how many people could sit in a certain section and they were just trying to figure it out just so they can have a chance to argue over their money, I guess. Well, yes. And I mean, they wouldn't be counted. You couldn't count individually in those days because these were big fucking buildings, but you could eyeball and you could see right. who was sitting where and how many overall. And of course, a lot of the guys didn't go into the mathematics that I did. So they just would yell, God damn, we got fucked. There must have been 8,000 people there. Actually, there was probably 5,500, and, you know, it's about normal. Whatever. But And some were really good. And, and obviously, Flair got used to seeing so many big crowds that he could pretty much come close. That's why, you know, the, the I've said this many times in Philadelphia in 86, the Veteran Stadium Bash. The fucking crowd me and Ric Flair both saw and the ticket prices that we were told, there was a six-figure discrepancy and something going on there. And we never solved it to this day. Elliot Murnick's gone now, I guess, so we'll never know. But something happened. He's a, I, was, I think I either said or Rick said they may have taken the goddamn expenses for the whole tour out of Philly that first night. Everything else I, I kind of agreed with in terms of what we were told versus what was there and what happened and et cetera. But Philly was uh, that veteran stadium. It was almost two civic centers worth of people. And I think they reported $210,000 at 50 and $20 tickets. So yeah, they were off about a hundred, 125. Welcome to the Northeast. There you have it. Well, there you have it. Well, there, well, take it back. I will not take anything. All this right. This is your show. We're finished with Rob. Should we move on to modern times? Jesus Christ. The Chaplin movie? No. No. Unfortunately not. AEW's Modern Times. The Chaplin movie? <laughs> <laughs> only, only if it was fucking Sidney Chaplin instead of Charlie. <laughs> uh, or maybe the Robert Downey Jr. version. And I'm going to say one more thing before we move on about the Tulsa and Oklahoma City and Gates and drawing power and et cetera. There's a lot of people say, ah, Cornette never drew any money. He just talks big. There's a lot of people say, well, I drew this or I did that. And some of them even might be true, but I'll guarantee goddamn to you one record that will never be broken. The Midnight Express and Watts and Dog in one day, in between 2 p.m. and 10 p.m. that night in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, for the last stampede had two shows that sold 20,000 tickets, turned 5,000 people away and drew $150,000, which is well over 400 grand in today's money. 
in fucking Oklahoma on a Sunday afternoon. Beat that. Fuck all y'all.